Why don't we pray? Why don't we pray? Father, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit. And uh, Lord, would you take these words of mine, would you take out uh, of them what doesn't need to be there, and would you put into them all that is of you, and move our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Good. Well, it's, uh, it's so good to be back as uh, open to God. Uh, I do, uh, I get to the end of the summer and I'm really missing it. So I'm really pleased that we're able to gather together again as a, as a congregation, as a, as a, as a family. Uh, I hope you all had a, a great summer. I did. Uh, some have complimented me on my tan. Uh, sadly, it's rust. Uh, <laughs> my summer was quite wet. <laughs> but we had a great time. Uh, a great time at New Wine. Uh, there was a moment when I walked into the tent of meeting, uh, which is what I like to call the main arena, um, and uh, it was the second, second to last morning, I think, and the glory of God in that place was, it was like a weight. I walked in and went, whoa, <laughs> it was like the air was thick, it was extraordinary. Amazing teaching, and I do have some CDs uh, of the teaching which I can lend out once I've sorted through them, and I'll... Uh, I'll try and fit some time for folks to talk a bit about their experiences in New Wine this, uh, this term. I think that would be a good thing to do. We then had uh, most of a week on a canal boat with uh, George's parents, uh, which was really lovely. And I only badly crashed the boat once and had to buy it a new light, so that was a resounding <laughs> success. <laughs> They're really hard to drive, as it turns out. I got the hang of it in the end. So, yes, we're starting our series on 1 Corinthians. Do you want to throw up 1 Corinthians? There we go. Um, we're going to be doing it over two terms because we wanted to, uh, to give it space to breathe, but also uh, it lets the preachers grapple with manageable chunks of the text. So half the letter this term, half uh, the letter after Christmas. I've also got a slot for our usual creative prayer evening that we find so helpful in stimulating our prayer lives. Our young people have got a slot, which I always really look forward to. And then I've got a couple of slots uh, for testimony. One next week. Oh, but Alison, she's very scared. And one at the end of term for Malcolm. Um, because it just so lifts your faith when you hear the real life experience of God uh, that somebody else has had. And again, I just want to start really this term... Uh, reminding us that all of open to God, all that we do here is principally for God's glory, of course, but our overriding desire is that it would equip us, that it would challenge us, encourage us, feed us, but most important, send us out in the power of the Holy Spirit and into the lives that we lead outside uh, church to minister God's power uh, and his glory there, because we all have a ministry we're all called to partner with God in the life that he's given us. And I think that's really so important. So, so Bibles. Let me say something about Bibles. I really want to encourage you to bring your own Bible with you. There are lots of Bibles here, so if you haven't, that's fine, of course. And every week, if you want to use our Bibles, that's fine. But it'd be great if you brought your Bible, the one that you read. You know, the one that you get uh, stuck into, that becomes uh, part of you in a strange way sort of way. I want to encourage you to write notes in it. That's not heresy. It's a write in your Bible. That's allowed. Write notes in it. Underline sections that jump out at you. Paint on it. Nicola Wood paints on her Bible. Have you seen it? It is amazing. She does creative um, stuff with her Bible as she reads it. If you want to bring a notebook too, uh, to write notes in, that's also great. They'll probably bring it another week when we've got a preacher worth taking notes from. I would say. So I'm going to introduce uh, St. Paul uh, first. Uh, the letter, obviously, is, uh, is written by Paul, and it's always good to keep in mind the person uh, that's writing this, uh, this letter. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about why he wrote the letter, uh, and what the church was like that he was writing to, uh, and then we'll read the passage. Malcolm's going to do that for me, and then we're going to break it open. So, Paul of Tarsus. He enjoys quite a reputation, Paul of Tarsus. Uh, often slammed for being sexist, uh, or at least having a dim view of women. I don't think that's true, personally. Um, I think he probably had a dim view of everybody. <laughs> or a very high view of everyone that was just 
seemed difficult to live up to. I think that's a better way of looking at it. Uh, he was uh, a, definitely a difficult man uh, to get on with. He didn't pull his punches. But I think that was because for Paul, as we read this letter, we will find this again and again, and again it was all about Jesus. That was Paul's main focus. He, it was all about holiness, and he was completely focused on preaching, teaching, and living out that holiness. There just wasn't space in his brain or his life for anything else, uh, really. He knew that Jesus was coming back, as we all do, uh, but he had this sense that it would probably be within his generation. And so you can really hear that urgency uh, in his writing, and you can definitely see it in the way that he lived his life. So Paul wasn't always Paul. I think you probably know that. Uh, there was a moment when Jesus got hold of him and transformed him, but he was born as Saul. Uh, and the main thing to know about that period of his life is that he was a Pharisee. So when you read in the Gospels about the scribes and the Pharisees, Paul was a Pharisee. Saul was a Pharisee. The best and the brightest of the Pharisees, by his own admission. So not a fan of Jesus. That's a really important thing to know. And indeed, uh, he spent many years tracking down Christians and having them arrested and punished. I don't know if you remember when uh, the crowd stoned Stephen to death. Saul was there holding the coats. And sort of encouraging them in what they were doing. And in fact, just a few verses after that in Acts chapter 8, it says that Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Until Jesus got hold of him. <laughs> and on the road to Damascus, everything changed for Saul. And his eyes were opened, both physically, if you read the story in Acts chapter 9, but also spiritually. Now his name change wasn't like Peter's. So uh, Peter, you'll probably know, was Simon. And then Jesus said to him, you are, I tell you, you are Peter. You are the rock on which I'm going to build my church. Uh, for Paul, it's not so much a name change as using another of his names. We know his father was a Roman citizen, as was he. Paul's just the Latin version of his name. Uh, and one that the Gentiles that he wanted to reach would have been more familiar with and, and more comfortable with than Saul. So in the first part of Acts, he's known as Saul. And then just, I can't remember what chapter it is, actually, but there's a line that says, Saul, also known as Paul, did X. And then from then on, it refers to him as Paul. But what's important about Paul is that he found the true fulfilment of everything that he was about in Jesus. So as a Pharisee, he took it as far as he could. And then in Jesus, he found what that was all about and what that meant. So the Pharisees believed, for example, in life after death. They believed in that, but they couldn't quite make sense of it until he met the risen Lord Jesus. And then that made sense. The Pharisees were also completely obsessed with holiness. But because they didn't have the right context for it, they made it all about themselves, which is something we're all guilty of, isn't it? Making everything about ourselves. But then Saul meets Jesus and has a reason and a context and a model for holiness. Jesus, worshipping him, emulating him, is the reason for holiness. And grace is the only way that we can manage it. The Pharisees are also obsessed with religious law which Saul had studied to post-post-postdoctoral <laughs> level, uh, but only finally understands it when he meets the Christ who was crucified. Law only makes sense when you meet the Christ who was crucified, the lamb that would rather be slain than slain. So that's Paul, one of the greatest thinkers in the world of that time. I think it's entirely possible that he'd memorised the whole of the Old Testament, for example. He quotes extensively from it in all of his letters. 
and I think it's improbable that he carried all those scrolls around with him, so I think he knew it. He's a man on a mission. He doesn't have time for distractions. He doesn't suffer fools very gladly. <laughs> he doesn't pull his punches. Uh, and he's completely obsessed with Jesus. That's the man who's writing this letter to uh, the Corinthian church. So let's talk about uh, the church in Corinth. If you've got mine, don't throw it up yet, but I've got a couple of pictures that I need in a minute. Um, the church in Corinth was planted by Paul, and this is according to the book of Acts in chapter 18, uh, just after his trip to Athens. So it's about AD 50, and he planted it with two guys that he met there, Aquila and Priscilla. So uh, he just went to Corinth, and the Holy Spirit basically led him to Aquila and Priscilla, uh, and he hung out with them for a while, making tents, doing life. Aquila and Priscilla were also tent makers who had recently been kicked out of Rome uh, with the rest of the Jews. All of this is in Acts 18. Um, and uh, while he was doing that, he would also go spend some time in the synagogue preaching uh, and arguing, which I guess is more like debating and apologetics rather than shouting at each other and calling each other names. So there is a massive falling out um, and the local Jews try and bring criminal proceedings uh, against Paul. Anyway, Paul is there for about 18 months building the church uh, before uh, moving on and leaving Apollos uh, to continue the work. Peter seems to have been there too. It mentions Cephas uh, was there and obviously in our letter Cephas uh, gets a name check um, today. Uh, and Chloe seems to have been uh, an important uh, leader in the church as well. And you can read that in several ways, but it strikes me that Paul wouldn't be so sexist as to, and then have you know, somebody important uh, writing to him from uh, a lady from that church. So Paul is writing uh, this letter to the church while he's in Ephesus. Have we got that map? Can you show up that map? Just let the technology uh, think about it. There we go. Okay, so oh, it's a little bit blurry. Never mind. Um, what happens if I go and point? Uh, I'm going to stand on this chair and break my neck. Here we go. So Ephesus is here in modern day Turkey. Corinth is here. So we know that Paul went to, when he planted the church, he went to Athens and then he just carried on and uh, rocked up in Corinth, uh, which is there. And Corinth is sort of between, well, I'll talk about this in a minute, this part of Greece and what you might call the mainland uh, of Greece. Uh, and we know as well in uh, writing this letter that even though this letter is called 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians is not actually the first letter they wrote to the church. There's at least one more letter before uh, 1 Corinthians that's sadly lost. And the lost letter sounds like, as you uh, read between the lines, that it was a pastoral letter like you'd get from the bishop to encourage the church and to help keep them on track. But it seems that uh, he'd encouraged them not to associate with immoral people. Elizabeth's going to be tackling this uh, in chapter 5. But they'd misunderstood his meaning completely. So Paul had to write another letter to correct that. He'd also had a letter from Chloe's people, or perhaps some of them had turned up in Ephesus, asking for a ruling on some very complex pastoral issues. So they're asking about marriage, they're asking about food offered to idols, they're asking about spiritual gifts, all of which make them sound like a top-notch church wrestling with some theological issues. Until he also got some verbal reports disclosing problems of divisiveness, of incest, of civil litigation, of immoral, uh, immorality, of women prophesying unveiled in church. Careful of that one, uh, ladies. Of abuse of the Lord's Supper and denial of the resurrection of the body. All of that was going on in the church in Corinth, which is all pretty serious stuff. So perhaps not all was not quite as well at Corinth as they'd like the apostle to believe it was. So what was Corinth like as a place? Because that will give us an idea, an insight into the people in the church and the culture 
that the church had to deal with. Well, Corinth, by the time of Paul, it was an important Roman colony in Greece, and it sat on the isthmus connecting the Greek mainland with the Peloponnesian Peninsula. And I've no idea what I've just said. <laughs> I didn't pronounce Pilo. Pilo what? Pilo Peninsula. Anyway, throw us the other slide up. Here we go. Google Maps from the first century. It's brilliant. Um, this is an isthmus. Who, who knew that? Who knew what an isthmus was? Did you really? Yes. I had to look it up. Oh, yes, that's true. <laughs> you knew what an isthmus was. Yes. So an isthmus <laughs> is a... <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's a small piece of land that acts as a land bridge between the mainland and what might have been an island. There you go. And Corinth is in that sort of small bit of land there. Um, it's got a canal across it now that you can see, but that was built in the 19th century. Um, in Paul's day, smaller boats would have been taken out of the sea and then dragged across the land and put back in on the other side and vice versa because it saved ages of sailing round in quite uh, tricky seas um, sorry it's, it's about that big I don't know <laughs> <laughs> does anybody know how big it is I mean is it miles it's quite well I'm just thinking that as well I mean they were quite small boats but yeah I mean, no I don't think it was that huge Okay. So it can't, be that. can't be really. Okay. Good insight. Good insight. And so you've got the Adriatic on one side, you've got the Aegean on the other. And basically, what that means is, for us anyway, is that. Sorry? Five kilometres. Oh, Google, thank you. Five kilometres. Five kilometres. There we go. Uh, that's a long way to drag a boat, though, doesn't it? Um, it's a really, basically what I'm trying to get to <laughs> is that it's a really important trading city. It's a really important trading city because of where it is. Um, it did have a, a significant Jewish population, if you think about the population of the city, which was protected under Roman law. But it also had a large Greek population because it used to be uh, a Greek town. Uh, it now had a large Roman population because the town had been rebuilt as a Roman colony. And then it had traders from just all over the known world. There's some debate whether the description of the temple to Aphrodite with its 1,000 temple prostitutes is accurate. Uh, but it is a Roman seaport. And so the culture wouldn't have been far from that in any case. So what you've got in Corinth is a largely pagan and very ethnically diverse population worshipping a large variety of gods and living lives that seemed very much at odds with the teaching of the Christian church. Does that sound familiar? It's funny, isn't it? But, you know, Paul's writing to a cultural milieu that is almost exactly like ours, apart from the technology. But socially, it's very similar to, uh, to what we live through and the problems that the church uh, struggled with being in that culture were also very similar. Malcolm, can I get you to come and read uh, the passage? If you've got a Bible, do you want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1? Nick, do you want to throw... 11, 4, 4. Sorry? Page is 11.44. If I give you a microphone, then you can... Thank you. Called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, 
in all your speaking and in all your knowledge. Because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptised in the name of Paul? I'm thankful that I did not baptise any of you, except Christus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptised into my name. Yes, I also baptised the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptised anyone else. But Christ did not send me to baptise, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Thanks be to the Lord for his word. Amen. Thank you. So if we look at uh, look at verse one. So Paul opens his letter in the same way that most letters in the ancient world started with acknowledging himself uh, as Paul. Uh, but notice that he uh, makes Sosthenes. Do you want to check it up? First one. Um, he, ma- he notices. Uh, sorry. Notice that he makes Sosthenes, who is working with him, the co-author of the letter. This is something that's obviously important to Paul to raise up and mentor uh, the leadership gifts of others. Uh, and if you want to see who Sosthenes is. And Crispus, actually, uh, that's mentioned a bit, uh, bit later, and why it's remarkable that Sosthenes is Paul's apprentice, then I uh, encourage you to read the first few verses of Acts 18. Verse 2 is the uh, address line. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So that's us isn't it? Even 2,000 years later, that's us. And notice that Paul calls them sanctified and called to be holy. He doesn't waste words, Paul. There's no fat to be trimmed in his letters. So he's deliberately reminding them that God is sanctifying them. God is sanctifying us. This means making them holy, making us holy. But they are also called to live holy lives. So it's a partnership with the Holy Spirit. These are all kind of laying the foundations for what uh, he wants to say. So, verse 4. I always thank my God for you. We're at the, the headline of the letter now. What is the most pressing thing that Paul wants to say? that will be the context for everything else that he will say in the rest of his letter. God has richly blessed you. You have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all kinds of knowledge. Which, he says, demonstrates that Paul's preaching about Jesus is true. So they are a church rich in the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Speaking in tongues, words of knowledge, prophecy, healing. There is, he says, no spiritual gift that has been withheld. Which is pretty exciting if you read his list of spiritual gifts. Miracles, for example. 
are on his list of spiritual things. He will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless, as Jill said, on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God's promise is that if you remain in him, he will remain in you, so that when Jesus returns and we meet him at the judgment, we will be blameless before him. I could just stop there, couldn't I? That was a remarkable thought. We will be blameless before him. That's what the cross means. Or as Paul puts it in Romans chapter 8, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God is faithful. Verse 9. Paul says uh, in this letter, he has called you into fellowship with his son Jesus Christ our Lord. And remember that what God means by fellowship or relationship is the Trinity. So God is relationship. He is fellowship. That is what the Trinity is. So therefore that's what God means when he talks about relationship. So when he says that God has called you into relationship or fellowship, to use another word, with Jesus Christ, he means in the same sense as the Trinity. That's the level of relationship that God uh, wants with you. So Paul sets up in these verses the context of who they are. They are the church of Jesus Christ. And there is no levels of, mini- of mystery to ascend in this. It's not like you start out as a level one Christian and you can name the persons of the Trinity. Level two and you can pray in public and then by 11 you're prophesying, healing the sick and raising the dead. That's that's not how it works. No, you do not lack any spiritual gift. That's what Paul says to them. They're all available to you. As soon as you give your life to Jesus, that's it. The whole of the Holy Spirit and everything is available to you. I've often seen, um, often, a couple of times seen someone who has been healed, for instance, um, who doesn't really know the Lord, comes to a sense of faith and then immediately is asked to pray for somebody else and seeing them healed as well. There is no sense in which you have to kind of grow as a Christian before God will use you. All the gifts are available to you. This is who you are. It's your identity, Paul is saying. And by extension, also being the Church of Jesus Christ, this is our identity too. But then having said that, and it's almost like having said to the naughty child, I love you, but, (laughs) well, to the employee, all these things are going really well for you at work. However, he then has to tell them off for the terrible scrapes that they've got themselves into, uh, or has to go through the list of things that they've stuffed up uh, at work, because uh, we now get into all the things that are really... uh, He has to really kind of uh, sort them out about. And top of the list, the thing that most concerns him, the absolute most, which is saying something when you consider that incest was mentioned in the introduction as a subject tackled by Paul in this letter. But top of the list is disunity and arrogance. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. And the Greek word there is the plural of brothers, adelphoi. And it's often used uh, for siblings uh, in the New Testament. So that's both men and women. I appeal to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. There had clearly grown a culture of arrogance. They had all sorts of spiritual gifts going on. And they were starting to think that they were it. Uh, and they were where it was at <laughs> as far as the kingdom of God went. And I'm sure you've never come across churches uh, that are pretty sure that if Jesus was to return for a catch-up before the second coming, he'd be going to their church. And it doesn't really matter what the tradition of church is. We do the most perfect mass, for example. You've never seen such fine vestments or our church seats 12,000 people we get all our audio visual guys from the BBC if Carlsberg made churches it would look like us 
That's essentially where they'd got to. When I was in Stoke, uh, as a university chaplain, we had three churches that had apparently got a mandate from God to save the city, all at the exclusion of all the other churches. In fact, one student worker actually said to me that their church would love it if the other churches in the city would step up and be as good as they were. Okay. So one of them in, in Corinth, do you want to just yeah, click on to the next? One says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas, which is Peter. Still another, playing the winning card in this game of apostolic top trumps, says, well, I follow Christ. <laughs> so there. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptised into the name of Paul? No. Christ didn't send me, Paul says, to baptise, much as he loved baptising. But to preach the gospel, and not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Because all of this is foolish. It's not about how spectacular your spiritual gifts are or your apparent lack of spiritual gifts. It's not about your wealth or lack of it or your background or whether you go to a mega church or a tiny village one. It's not about even whether you're evangelical or Catholic, charismatic, conservative or liberal. It's all about Jesus and him crucified. It's all about the cross and nothing else matters. It's not about this personality or that personality, this ministry that you're connected to or that ministry. It's all about Jesus. Everything else is secondary. And that is the underlying problem that the church in Corinth had. It had shifted its focus from Jesus. It had become about them about what they could do, about what their needs were, about what they could justify because of who they were and whose faction they belonged to. And in taking their eye off Jesus, they'd led them into all sorts of problems, as we will see in the coming weeks. Let's finish there. Let's take a, a moment to reflect. I'm going to pray. Let's process a bit. Um, and to uh, allow God by his Holy Spirit to bring things up or to cement things that he's highlighted for us, the underlying things in your Bible. Remember that we will pray with you if there's anything you'd like to pray through. Let's just take a moment of quiet.